Hi everyone, the best, best teeth, teeth in the, the game. game here, you know who it is, and it's time for another edition of Let's Argue, where I hit you up on social media, I welcome your hot takes, unpopular opinions, and tough questions, I answer the best ones in video segments such as these, and uh, yeah, that's it. Let's get into it. Let's go! The death of an artist shouldn't be incentive to call their music good. Uh, yeah, this is absolutely 110% the case. Uh, here's the thing, like, I, I know that emotions are very raw when an artist passes away and it's uh, really hard to kind of get uh, a fair critique in edgewise because everybody's like sort of waiting to react in a really strong and emotional fashion because they connected with that person's music on, on a very intimate and emotional level and they almost feel like indebted uh, to that person because their music spoke to them. Um, however, like, you, you don't need to go overboard and act like you enjoy the person's music when honestly truly, you didn't really, uh, just because they passed away, or act like you really cared uh, the whole time when you really didn't. I mean, you know, uh, I, I respect artists and, and everybody as individuals, uh, but at the end of the day, like, whether you're alive, whether you pass away, whether you're a good person, bad person, so on and so forth, uh, it doesn't really impact how I feel about your music on a personal level. If I like it, I like it. If I don't, I don't. The end. Why is electronic music and EDM largely ignored by music critics? When it comes to EDM specifically, I guess I'll say that it feels like a lot of the bigger, more mainstream records in the genre don't really lend themselves to an album format, as it kind of seems like every single song is trying to scratch the exact same itch. It's a lot of very formulaic wash, rinse, repeats. But as far as electronic music in general goes, I'm, I'm not really sure. I mean, uh, I, I personally feel like I'm part of the problem, so I mean, I can't really uh, say, hey, you know, well, I'm doing a good job, or blah, 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 I mean, I cover some electronic music, though I will say other genres typically get uh, more attention from me personally. I mean, every year there are at least a few electronic music records that really kind of stand out to me, blow me away. Certainly the new Nicholas Jar Against All Logic is going to uh, be an example of that for 2018. But honestly, I, I really don't have any, uh, uh, super specific answer to this question outside of a lot of the time I'm just kind of going where my ears are taking me and uh, I'm just not really hearing uh, a lot of electronic records that are kind of exciting me so much I'm just dying to talk about them I guess uh, much in the same way I don't review a whole lot of you know country music either so again nothing personal against the genre or anything like that um, I guess it's just kind of a matter of personal taste curation preference. On top of that, what a lot of you guys are asking me to review as opposed to uh, not so much. Nas only has one classic album and doesn't deserve to be called a legend. It was written. Look, I mean, I'll be the first one to admit that Nas <laughs> does not have the most consistent discography. I think one could say that he's fallen off and he does not really have the artistic hunger and desire that he used to, but you, you gotta respect the fact the man has come out with one of the most essential records of the 90s in the genre of rap music. You were wrong saying George was the best musician in the Beatles, Quincy Jones vid. Paul was the best musician. Paul is a top 10 bassist of all time. His bass playing is grossly overlooked. Listen to Bulldog Come Together, Taxman. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess uh, you could probably say Paul was a more skilled musician than George. You know, George, great guitarist, but Paul, he really was a great all-arounder. On top of that, a better songwriter, too. Um, and, uh, yeah, it is true. I mean, on those tracks, you do literally have, like, some of the most legendary bass lines in rock history, especially come together. I mean, goddamn. Um, that's, that's a truly groundbreaking bass line. You know, for the time that that bass line came out, like... Who else's bass lines were sounding like that? Yeah. Fair. 
fair. Yankee UXO is better than lift your skinny fists up to heaven. Lift your is excellent, but Yankee has greater dynamics in terms of sound, especially because of Steve Albini's production, which made the buildup uh, in each song much more huge. The riffs are also a tad better to me too. I don't know, man. I think the compositions on lift your are better though. They're better. They're better compositions. The ambient passages are more eerie as well, although I will say I do think Yankee is, is routinely underrated. I mean, while I do think Lift Yours is the better record, uh, I, I really truly think it's only slightly better. I think both albums are honestly excellent. Anderson Pack has the best teeth in the game. Ah! Yeah, that's, that's true. His teeth are fucking fantastic. Um, quite jealous of them. Very nice teeth, Anderson. Very nice teeth. I, res I respect it. Real ones respect other real ones. Real recognize real. Real fucking teeth game. Real teeth. I, I respect it. Most of the people chiming slash bringing up the Donald Glover infringement issue don't really know much about copyright law to begin with. In that same vein, if the country is going to get so happy over vibe infringement, things are going to get so damn messy. Yes, absolutely. That's why the Robin Thicke, uh, Marvin Gaye settlement is so shitty. Like, you're just suing somebody over just a vague aesthetic similarity. You're not talking about lyric plagiarism, you're not talking about melodic plagiarism, like what the fuck? Again, even if that song is somehow miraculously an inspiration on This Is America, Glover took that influence and artistically transformed it so far, there are literally no specific artistic or compositional parallels between the two songs that you could truly sue over. So stop being stupid! Concerts at giant seated arenas are so anti-personal you might as well stay home and listen to the record. I mean, I kind of agree with this. I hate it when an artist kind of jumps on a stage and the DJ just basically plays the same fucking instrumental you've heard and they just kind of give the same performance that you've heard on the record and there's literally no reason because the, the live performance is just like a shittier version of the album that you've heard and maybe you're seeing the person as like a tiny little ant on the stage. However, if you know that they're an artist that puts on an interesting and an amazing and a top-notch visual show and does interesting things with staging and maybe they perform with a live band too, so they work in some great variations that you wouldn't hear on the album. Even if you are very far away and uh, sort of at a distance uh, from the performance itself, uh, it's it's it can still be worth it. Also recently, I, I blew quite a bit of, of money uh, seeing Slayer's Farewell Tour. <laughs> And um, even though they played all the songs on the record pretty straightforward, uh, and there were some pretty cool visuals on the stage with the logos and pyrotechnics and, and banners and everything, I wouldn't say it was the best live show I've ever been to, but certainly um, I, I, I don't regret going. Not at all. It was a good experience. You've always been dismissive of little Uzi Vert's talent. He has an incredible melodic ear and crafts earworms on Dan near every single song. Combine that with a great ear for production and you get some of the best trap style music coming out these days. Yeah, it's, it's tweets like this that just make me feel like I'm living in another dimension. I just don't hear any of this at all. I mean, for sure, there are standout moments in his discography. You know, you do have your P's and Q's, you do have your EXO tour life, so on and so forth, where you are talking about super sticky lyrics, you are talking about a great vocal melody. But most of the time, it just kind of sounds like he's riffing. Uh, and not really putting that much thought into the melodies that he sings on his tracks. Uh, some of the production is pretty quirky, but a lot of the time I just find his vocals to be super grating. Um, I get that he has a kind of unique style and aesthetic, and a lot of artists do copy that, but uh, I think Uzi's execution leaves a whole lot to be desired, and that's mostly where his music underwhelms me, so... I don't know. With the rise of many female pop artists in the indie and alternative pop field, I'm pretty salty that Kimber isn't more popular. She's delivered three fantastic albums on par talent-wise with Janelle Monet, and is a better vocalist than Billie sure. Georgia Smith and her combined. Um, I pretty much agree with a lot of what you have said here. I do think Kimber is a fantastic vocalist, better than a lot of people give her credit for. Uh, however, what I think her albums just continue to lack is 
focus is an artistic identity. On one album after another, Kimber plays artistic chameleon, kind of grabbing sounds, ideas, and aesthetics from her contemporaries, or kind of just aping older sounds uh, in the pop field. And as a result, it's kind of hard going into a record knowing what a Kimbra record is going to sound like. I think that continues to be her Achilles heel, honestly. I'm gonna leave it at that. This has been another episode of Let's Argue. Over here next to my head is another episode, or rather a playlist, uh, in the Let's Argue series that you can check out. And um, I love you. You're the best. Anthony Fantano, Let's Argue forever.